to Lessons from the Playroom. In this podcast, Lisa Dion will help you explore the little things that make a big difference in play therapy. Lisa is the founder and CEO of the Play Therapy Institute of Colorado and the creator of Synergetic Play Therapy. You know, sometimes therapists get all caught up trying to study big theories and mastering techniques to help children like me. But sometimes it's the little things we show you along the way that make the biggest difference. Join Lisa as she teaches you some of the little lessons that children are trying to communicate to you so that you can help us in the best ways possible. And on behalf of all the kids you work with, thanks for listening and believing in us. Let's get started. Hi, everyone tuning in. This is the next episode from the Lessons from the Playroom series. This episode is part of the bi-weekly podcast. And the other part of the Lessons from the Playroom series is the one-hour monthly webinar live with me. Or if you can't make it live, you can always get the 24-hour playback. And there is the possibility of getting credits for that as well. So as we are heading now into the holiday season, I decided that I wanted to give you a gift. Um, I really thought through what topic I wanted to present today and one of the things that feels so important to me as a teacher and a supervisor is not just offering information about what's happening in the play therapy room and the play therapy process. We know that's really important, but I also have a really big investment in the development of play therapists as people, as individuals. And I think sometimes we spend a lot of time really trying to understand technique and play therapy theory, and we lose sight of really it's the development within us ultimately that actually is the most important part of what we bring to the play therapy process. I know that I have created um, synergetic play therapy, but I've also, in my studies along the way, have studied many, many other play therapy theories and ideas, and I can tell you with certainty that they're all awesome in their own way. There really isn't one play therapy theory that is better than another theory. And and in doing so, what I've really come to understand is that whatever theory you pick, as long as it is congruent for you, you're, you're going to be all right. So then the next question really boils down to, okay, well, once we have play th- therapy theory down, what about the development of the play therapist? So that's what this particular episode is about, is I want to talk about one of the most challenging parts about being human. And I want to offer a gift to you, and it's the gift of beginning to understand rejection. Now you may think, really, Lisa, that's that's the gift? And, And yes, because rejection is one of the most challenging experiences that I think we can have as humans. Um, it, it really taps into a, a core sense of inadequacy and a sense of, of belonging um, within us that can get messed with when we start to feel or perceive that we're being rejected by people or even rejecting ourselves. And this doesn't just show up outside of the playroom, it shows up in the playroom too, right? The child rejects us, sometimes the parents reject us. And then we also have the experience of rejection in our everyday life as well. So here's my gift to you. I want to teach you something today that's not play therapy related. I want to offer you some insight into the psychology behind rejection. And I want to help you begin to understand what it is and actually how to use rejection. I want you to begin to see rejection as a gift. Now, I said that I wanted to choose a gift for you heading into the holiday season, and I think this is the perfect gift heading into the holiday season because many of us are going to be around family, we're going to be around people that in our past we have perceived as rejecting us. And so you might find yourself in a scenario perceiving being rejected, and I want you to have this tool, I want you to have this insight, I want you to use this 
not only as a play therapist, but in your own personal development as a therapist and, and as a human being. So let's just start with normalizing rejection, and then I'm going to get into the psychology behind rejection a little bit. So I don't know anybody that doesn't get rejected. Everybody has the experience of being rejected. I'm going to propose here as we go through this podcast that it's actually a necessary experience in order for your growth and your self-discovery. But nobody is immune from the perception and the experience of rejection. I think sometimes when we get rejected, the immediate thought after that is, oh, there must be something wrong with me, right? I must have done something wrong. And I want to break that down a little bit because that may and most likely not is the case. So I want to expand our thinking around rejection a little bit. So here's the deal. Rejection, as I said, is part of the human experience, and I alluded to that it's actually a necessary part of the experience. Rejection is an experience that comes in the form of a polarity. And what I mean by that is rejection and praise come side by side in our lives. They show up side by side. But the way that our mind works is we block information out and we tend to only focus on half of the experience. So what I mean by this is that it is impossible to be rejected without simultaneously someplace in your life being accepted. I really want you to take that in. It's impossible in your life to be rejected without simultaneously someplace in your life being accepted. Now you may think, How does she know that? Why is she saying that? And one of the things that I love to study beyond my play therapy studies and beyond neuroscience is um, universal law and physics and human behavior at a large scale. And when you really start to get into understanding human behavior and you start to even take what we would call universal principles and laws and you apply them over uh, human behavior and human dynamics, what you begin to understand is that everything in our experience is made up of a pair of opposites. Um, Even your senses, so when I say your senses, I literally mean like your eyes, um, your skin, Um, the taste buds on your tongue, all of the sense organs, if you will, our senses, in order for them to even register data, they have to do it through a comparing and contrasting experience. So even at that level, right, we are in a sense rejecting something, accepting something, comparing, contrasting, everything comes in pairs of opposites. But again, I said that the way that our brain takes in information, we actually filter out the majority of the data that we bring in. So when we are um, perceiving the experience of rejection, it's actually only part of the equation. As I said, somewhere else in your life, you are actually being accepted at that same time. If someone pulls away from you, Someone else is actually coming towards you. Now, you may just sit there and scratch your head and go, I don't know about this. And I'm just going to invite you to get curious about this. I want you to, this is one of those things where you're going to have to really look and you're going to have to really see for yourself if there's some merit to what I'm talking about. And so the, the process is really when you perceive that you're being rejected to pause and ask yourself who right now in my world is accepting me. Who right now is appreciating me? Who wants me close? Who wants me part of their group? Who wants me to be in relationship with them? If you look and you allow yourself to expand your awareness, you will find it every time. So I'm going to pause here because I'm going to build on this throughout this, um, this sequence. When in our psyche, we are highly attached to praise, okay? And we are highly attached to having a, I'm going to call it a fantasy, of a one-sided growth experience, right? That somehow in our mind, we think that we can grow by only being supported, 
right? That's the fantasy that we're just going to get supported, that people are going to love what we do, that everyone's going to jive with our ideas and with our experience. And we have this fantasy that people are going to like us, right? Everyone's going to want us to be part of their group. And the more we are attached when we perceive the rejection or we have the rejection, the more painful it's going to be. It actually, in the brain, we actually get dopamine through the fantasy. So when I have a fantasy or I have a, a desire um, to be accepted by a particular group or for people to like me, when I engage in that fantasy, the brain is actually providing me dopamine. It's a really interesting phenomenon that happens in the brain. The rejection comes in and actually produces in the, in the, in the, in the body um, what we might call the, the pain experience. And the pain experience is actually designed, get this, to break our fantasy of that it is better to be accepted or to be praised. Because if you look throughout your life, you will realize that you've never gone through an experience or a time in your, your life where all you received was acceptance. You've been supported and challenged your entire life. You've had people who like you. You've had people that don't like you. You've had people that think what you're up to is awesome. You've had people that are disappointed in you. You've had people that want to connect with you. You've got people that want nothing to do with you. You want, you've got people that want to be in a relationship with you. You want there, you've got people that, you know, don't want anything to do with you. This is part of it. And again, it comes in, in pairs and we need to open up our perceptions wide enough to be able to see that we're never having a one-sided experience. It's just our illusion that we are and we're overly attached to one side so that when we experience the other side, the pain of that feels really, 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 really hard. Now, the reason why I'm pointing that out is because you're gonna be rejected, as I've said. And if you are not at the point in your own growth and development where you can take a deep breath and begin to see the gift in the rejection, you're going to continue to seek out one-sided experiences and those rejection experiences are going to keep registering as more and more and more painful. I mean, I can look at this in my own life. Um, there are a lot of people that don't agree with what I have to say. There are a lot of people that don't agree with um, my, my thinking. There are people that don't like me for whatever reason. And there are also people that think what I have to say is pretty cool. And people that you know want to be a part of what I'm creating and what I'm offering in this world. I've got both. One of the coolest places where I see this play out and I've spoken to many, many other teachers and presenters, and this is a, a universal experience which confirms um, this principle that I'm trying to teach you. And for those of you that present who are listening to this podcast, you will totally get what I'm saying here. So usually at the end of a conference, you receive the compilation of the feedback that everybody in the audience um, you know, gave about the presentation. And most places, when they give you the feedback, they'll stack up all the positive feedback first, right? They'll, they'll tell you the good news before the bad news. I have learned that when I start to read my feedback, if it is overly, overly positive, as I'm initially reading, you know, oh my gosh, it was the greatest presentation of the conference, bring her back as the keynote, um, learn more from her in one hour than I did, you know, in a semester at grad school, blah, like really, really, really profound praise. I know that somebody in that audience completely bashed me. And so all I've got to do is flip to the last page of the compilation of feedback, and I find it every single time. I, in order for my growth, and because this comes in pairs, I have to be accepted and rejected simultaneously in order for me to grow. And if I have a belief that everyone's going to love what I teach, everyone's going to love what I have to say, 
I will only focus on those couple of people that gave me the really, really challenging feedback and probably create a story that somehow I'm bad, somehow I'm wrong, somehow I screwed up, when the reality is, is that no, all I did, and here's one of the key pieces of understanding rejection, I simply challenged their way of thinking. Everybody has a viewpoint. Everybody has ideas that feel really meaningful for them. They've got beliefs. Um, they have things that, uh, that they value most in life, things that they perceive bring them great meaning. And just know that when you're out there in the world and you start talking or you start interacting with somebody and you challenge one of their beliefs or you challenge an idea or something that feels really meaningful for them, go ahead and expect rejection to be part of the experience. It doesn't mean you did something wrong. It simply means there's a clash in what both of you perceived was most important. You are not more right than they are. It just means different. So I want you to get that. Rejection means different. Rejection simply means we don't see eye to eye. And when somebody rejects you, it simply means that you said something or did something that they perceive um, goes against their belief system or goes against their philosophy or how they perceive things should be. And they're then going to go and they're going to find people that they perceive support their belief system. And by the way, you're going to do this too. You will reject people that you perceive are different than you, that you perceive don't support what's most meaningful for you. Now, in our limited thinking, we're going to call them bad or we're going to judge them in some way. They're not bad. Um, they're simply different. So I want you to take a deep breath as you're, as you're hearing that. Rejection means different. It just means that we have different points of view. Now let's go one step further. When somebody actively rejects somebody else, chances are that there is a self-judgment going on inside of them. Because let's be honest, when somebody is regulated and they feel deeply connected to themselves, and they feel grateful, and they are really loving themselves, even in a moment when they perceive differences with somebody else, they don't reject them. They simply see it as different. So just notice that within yourself. When you find yourself rejecting others, how are you feeling? Are you feeling adequate? Are you feeling challenged? What's going on with you where you are then feeling like rejecting them right is because all you're doing is giving them an experience of actually what it feels like to be you um, versus taking a step back taking a deep breath recognizing wow we're different that's it we're simply different so for those of you that are listening and you're scratching your head I hope that you will listen to this podcast many many times and take notes and I'm not done with this topic we're gonna keep going because this is a this is a big one the um, the piece here that's that's next to talk about is how do we use rejection to help our growth? So we've established that you're going to be rejected. You need rejection. It comes in pairs. Um, the moment that you perceive you're rejected, you're actually also being accepted by other people in your life. You've just chosen to focus on where you're being rejected and not seeing the whole picture. So what do we do with the side of the equation where we're being rejected? My biggest gift to you with this is to listen to the rejection, as painful as it is. To take that breath and to listen. Because the feedback that they're giving you is invaluable information for you about, um, about um, how you're communicating with them potentially, about how other people perceive you, about how other maybe you've created something, how other people perceive your creation, and and listen to it and take the rejection seriously, because they're offering you insight into how you might need to position yourself or how you might need to change your language so that you can communicate in terms of what's meaningful to other people. So I'm gonna give a really practical example. So not everybody loves synergetic um, play therapy. 
And there are some people that have critiques about it. And I need them. I need the, I need the critique because the critique helps me think through what it is that I'm teaching. And it helps me think through how strongly do I believe what I'm teaching. Um, it also helps me go, oh, that's interesting. I hadn't, I hadn't really seen it that way or I'm missing part of the puzzle. So here's what I do. When I'm rejected, particularly around, let's say, synergetic play therapy, I listen. I take everybody's feedback really seriously and I write it down. And I actually spend time deeply thinking about each thing that somebody said. So whether it's someone said something to you directly or they sent me an email or I read it in a, um, you know, in the compilation of the feedback after presenting somewhere, I think about it. And then I think about how could I have communicated something differently? Um, is there something that I'm not teaching well? And this feedback is helping me see where I need to tighten up my teaching. Is this feedback actually offering me some insight into maybe something that I'm missing and that I need to be paying attention to? Because if I'm deeply committed to being a teacher, then I want to know where the loopholes are. And I want to know what makes sense to people. And I want to know what doesn't make sense to people. Same thing. So with my daughter, who's almost 12, when she gives me feedback and I perceive it as rejection, I stop. I listen. I really try to take it in. I think it's important that when we get re we experience rejection, that we try to stay in a, in a place of openness rather than closing down and contracting and getting defensive because once we do that, we can't actually hear the wisdom in the feedback that we're getting. So when Avery says something to me about something she doesn't like or, or something that, um, that's not going well for her in terms of my parenting, I listen. And then I, again, I consider what about that could I do differently? Um, how could I help her understand how I'm meeting her needs? How could I communicate in a way that lands as meaningful for her and maybe in a way that she understands? Or at the very end of it, I may just go, thank you for confirming to me that I really feel confident in what I'm doing because that's also valuable. Sometimes the wisdom of being rejected is actually to help us connect to ourselves more deeply. Right, So if someone else isn't going to accept me, am I going to accept me? One of the biggest lessons that I've learned in my career is that it doesn't matter how clear the vision is. It doesn't matter how much I want something to happen. I will only grow to the degree that I can handle both the support and the rejection. That will be the ceiling of my growth. The more you grow, the more rejection you actually create to, to counterbalance the acceptance of whatever it is that, that, that you're doing. As I said, it, they come in pairs. And, and if I can't hold both, I mean, think of world leaders. How much are they both accepted and rejected? Think of movie stars, accepted and rejected. Right? Think of people that have, have had great contributions in the world, accepted and rejected. You don't grow without acceptance and reject, rejection. And you will only grow to the point in which you can hold both. And that point will be the, the place where you will stop because it'll be too scary to take that next step forward. So use rejection to propel you forward. Use it as a gift. See it as feedback to help you be better at you, whatever it is that you're trying to do, to help you attach to yourself, to help you sync up. And the last piece I'll say is get curious about when you're rejecting yourself because there's a high probability, that thing I said at the very beginning here, when we're attached to the praise and we're attached to a one-sided experience and a fantasy, that the pain has to step in to help us break our infatuation. The same is happening inside of our own psyche. The more you try to be someone that you're not, the more that you have a fantasy of who you think you are in your psyche to counterbalance that, you will put yourself down. You will find a way to reject yourself internally. And again, it is attempting to break your fantasy of who you think you are. 
So I'm going to take a deep breath on this one. And again, my hope is that you will listen to this a couple of times and really let this information sink in. I really want you to embrace rejection as a gift. I want you to see that they're happening simultaneously, the support and the rejection. I want you to see that the more that you strive for a one-sided experience, the more painful the duality of life is actually going to register for you. I want you to see that rejection is just another part of what is attempting to guide you back to your authentic self. It's trying to guide you back to your certainty. It's trying to guide you back to your growth. It's trying to guide you um, back to a place within you where you can create, where you can feel purposeful, where you can put something extraordinary out there to the world and you need it. You need the rejection. Um, you need the praise, you need both, because at the end of the day, they both guide you back to you. So that is my gift to you. Um, I encourage you to breathe heading into these holidays. I encourage you to remind yourself of um, who you are. I encourage you to regulate, um, find gratitude, not only for the things that support you, but also things that challenge you. And until next time on the next episode, be well.